Good to be here. Thanks, Glenn. You nervous? A little bit. <laughs> All right, good. Not the only one. Uh, so actually, before we started on the talk, I wanted to uh, ask you a question. One of the most fun things for me in preparing has just been looking at a lot of images of, of some of the shows you put on, and artists in particular, and a lot of time on Cy Twombly, who we'll talk about uh, shortly. But I know this April would be Cy's 90th birthday. What, what, what do you have planned? What's going to be going on to celebrate uh, that? We're going to have a, we're going to have an exhibition to kind of celebrate uh, Twombly's 90th birthday in our uh, in our gallery on on 21st Street. We're, we've put together I think close to 100 works on paper, ranging from the early 50s to works he did right right to the end of his life. It's going to be it's going to be uh, I think really a fantastic show, with the cooperation of, of the uh, Cy Twombly Foundation and Nicola Del Rocio and many private lenders. Um, it's a, show I'm, it's a show I'm looking forward to very much. It's going to be great. Awesome. I'll look forward to that for sure. Let's go back to the beginning. Just start a little bit. I know you grew up in Los Angeles. Tell us, what was your family life like? Was there any art at all? Were your parents interested in art? What kind of a, of a home were you growing up in? Uh, I grew up in a, I guess, middle class, middle class home. We didn't, we didn't really have any art in our home. Uh, I wasn't really exposed to art in terms of going to galleries or museums. It wasn't wasn't part of my growing up experience, nor my parents. So I, you know, I never really thought of art as um, a profession for, for a dealer or even a professional artist. Just wasn't in my radar until I got to college. And, uh, you know, when you get to college, you start learning things and started getting exposed to art. Actually, didn't take any art classes, per se, but um, there was a gallery in Westwood Village, um, Virginia Dwan Gallery. That was, I think, the first gallery I ever walked into. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was mind blowing for me. I remember at the time I was, I don't know, in my twenties, and I walked into this white space, with I think it was a Robert Irwin show or something, a beautiful uh, minimal art show, and I was, I, and it was, I remember, I remember that very, very clearly. It was, uh, it was kind of a, a, I got a jolt from that, and it made me more curious. And when you were growing up in LA, were you thinking like Hollywood? Did you have kind of dreams of, of Hollywood, or, or, or what was, what were you thinking you were going to do when you were a kid? I didn't, you know, Glenn. I, I really, to be honest with you, I, I, I wasn't that ambitious as, as a kid. I didn't really, uh, yeah. Uh, and it did, you know, it didn't bother me. I didn't feel like, geez, I got to get my act together, I, you know. Um, most of my friends weren't that ambitious, so it wasn't a problem. But <laughs> <laughs> I could keep up with them. So, so ultimately, you end up at the William Morris Agency. Uh, were you an agent? Were you in the in the no, mail? No, I, was, I was. I was on. I was on a track to if things went right, and and I kept kept interest in it. I would have become an agent. Uh, I became an assistant agent, secretary. Uh, and it just never took? I mean, what was it? I didn't, it's something about the office environment and the way the whole thing was set up. I mean, I met some fascinating people. Some of them are still friends of mine, Ron Meyer, Mike Ovitz, they're still good friends of mine. Was Ovitz there as like a junior nobody the same time you were there? He was, no, he was, I would never call him Ovitz a nobody. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he was, you know, a go-getter. He was, I think, the head of the television packaging department. So he was already on the... And I was his secretary. So you worked directly, directly for I him? I worked directly under Mike. Wow. And was he collecting back then, do you remember? Uh, I, I think he had just started to buy, like, prints or drawings. He was, but he got interested in art quite early. Okay, so you're, you're, so you're at William Morris and you're not loving it. No. And then something happens with poster sales? I mean, what, what, how does that well, transition I got, I got, go? They, they let me go. Okay. okay. They, 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 uh, I guess, just to clear it up. I think the word is, <laughs> I, think the word is I was fired. Okay. And, <laughs> And um, which was kind of a relief for me because it was just like ninety dollars a week. I'm re I'm working sixty hours, uh, you know, sixty hours a week. It was a lot of work, no pay, and um, but I had no I had no real prospects, and I got a job parking cars in Westwood Village. Uh, so really, it was really just about making an income at that point. Yeah, ne I needed to make some money, mm -hmm. and then um, as it turned out, I saw somebody selling posters, and um, basically just copied that that guy's business. I bought posters from the same place he bought posters. And what, what, what was on these I, posters? What did the posters look like? These posters were really, you know, if, the, if there's a, le a level below schlock, that would be, <laughs> that, would, that would be what this was. So like a pussy. Not museum posters. Like a no, cat no, with no, yarn. Something like that. Okay, so, so I, I yeah, tracked it down. I tracked oh, it God. down. Okay. Now you. That's you, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you were selling these for 15 bucks, is that right? Uh, 
I would buy the poster for around a dollar, and then I would put a little frame on it and try to sell it for close to 15. If I got anything above 10, it was it was a good sale. Because it's fascinating. You 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 picked the right thing to sell because this is literally still framed 15 bucks on Amazon. Really? Yeah. Not been a lot of movement not in the lot, cat yarn poster market. Not a lot of appreciation <laughs> there. <laughs> All right, so you so you so you're very successfully selling these these beautiful posters, right? And then how do you move from there to, to kind of legitimate well, art? I, you know, I started selling more expensive posters, and um, you know, I sell a poster with a frame for fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, uh, and then I got a little frame shop upstairs. There was a cheap space available. I think it was forty dollars, forty dollars a month for a space, and Kim Gordon, who everybody knows is a great musician, Sonic star Youth, of the yeah. groups. She was my framer, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we had a lot of fun. You know, I was making money, I was making money. Then I met Henry Miller. I talked him into doing a watercolor show in my poster shop. It was a thrill just to meet Henry Miller. And I, and I convinced him that this would be kind of a fun thing to do, so we showed a bunch of his watercolors in my little poster shop. And then I got really, you know, excited. I started reading art magazines. I started, you know, going as fast as I could, becoming very engaged. In, in, in making money for the first time in my life and learning about something that I found was, you know, really, really fascinating and, and enriching. And were you also taking some profits and buying art yourself at that point or not yet? Not, not really, not really, not really. And so then how did the transition to New York come? Transition to New York came, um, uh, I read, a, there was a magazine and there was a photograph by a photographer named Ralph Gibson. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wasn't particularly knowledgeable about contemporary photographer, but it appealed to me. And uh, I called up, you know, LA information, no Ralph Gibson. I said, well, you know, a lot of artists live in New York. Called up New York information. I got the guy on the phone. Turned out to be a really nice guy, who I'm still friends with. And I said, you know, Ralph, I, th I just saw your photograph in this magazine, Art in America, whatever it was, and I think it's really, really cool. Would you consider sending me some of these photographs so I could sell them in my poster shop. And, you know, most, under those circumstances, you could imagine most photographers would say, forget it, end of conversation. But he said, well, you'd have to come to my studio and, and, uh, and see the work. And so I'd never been to New York. And he invited me to come to New York. And, uh, and you got a bunch of photographs. His, it turned out he was represented by Leo Castelli, which was very, very fortunate. Did you know at the Leo. time who Leo, Leo was? Ralph. I knew who Leo was, yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew who Leo was. He, I mean, his name was such a big name. Right. So you took a bunch of photographs back to L.A.? Back to L.A., put them in, put them in my poster shop, sold them. Ralph came out, had a great party, and that sort of... And then that started you wanting to be more in New York? More, in New, more in New York. I started going back and forth between L.A. and New York. I was living in New York. That was where my gallery was. Well, it was a poster shop at the time. It wasn't a gallery. Mm -hmm. But I was going back and forth as much as I could afford. And then ultimately in New York, you ended up meeting Basquiat, Jean-Michel Basquiat. I met Basquiat, yeah. And, and where did you meet him? This is a, a great photo. You, you look like an agent here. This looks to me. Well, you know, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, I met Basquiat. Uh, it, was, it, was a fluke, it was a fluke meeting. It was a great encounter. Uh, Barbara Kruger, who I'd met and uh, became friends with in New York, this is like 1981. She called me up. I had a loft on West Broadway, which I had bought a couple years before actually traded a, a work of art for it. We're going to get there. And Barbara, Barbara calls me up and says, Larry, I'm in this group show at the Nina Nose's gallery on Prince Street. And Nina was a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. would, you come up, would, would you come over for the opening? Tonight's the opening. I said, sure. So I walked over to Nina's gallery on Prince Street. And she had three rooms, three exhibition rooms, kind of a long, thin gallery. And the first one was some kind of conceptual architectural sculpture. Don't recall the artist. The next room was Barbara Kruger photographs with the, you know, sim similar strategy to what she does now. Mm -hmm. And then the next room, the last of these three rooms, there were these paintings in the room uh, that uh, I, I tell you, the hair stood up when I saw. I mean, it was like elect literally electrifying. Just literally never nothing seen like you'd ever seen like before. It. I'd no. never seen anything like it. And I, you know, I hadn't heard of the, the guy. I never heard the name Bosquet. I'd never seen a painting by him. I'd had no idea who, who made these paintings. And then Nina walks out. And, and she says, Larry, do you like these? And I said, they're fucking amazing. I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I love them. Um, and, and, and I said, what's, what's, uh, are they sold or what's, and she says, well, no, these three, there were five paintings. These three are not, are not spoken for. 
And I said, well, I'll buy all three of them. And so she sold me those three paintings. Do you remember how much they were? When I met Basquiat, he happened to be in her office. How, how much were the paintings? Around $3,000 each. Okay. Um, Which was not dirt cheap for an artist you never heard of at that time, or what? They were so good. Yeah. They were so good. Right. I mean, there was no mistaking it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I met him. Uh, he was in her office for the opening. And we kind of hit it off. And we, you know, we became friends. And I convinced him to do a show in LA. And Nina went along with it. She, she, she supported it. He painted the paintings all in her basement. And then we shipped them to LA. I don't think he'd ever been to LA before. And we had a mm. fantastic time. And he had a girlfriend at the time, right? Well, this is just before he had the famous girlfriend. That was, a, I think, a year later. He's, he's living in my house now in Venice Beach. And you know, it's one of the craziest <laughs> domestic environments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into all the details. but, um, but um, Fun was had. We had a lot of fun. And then one, one day he says, you know, my girlfriend's coming out to stay with me for a while. I'm saying, geez, you know, what's, what's when he's at your house, saying he's saying, myself, my girlfriend's coming you know, over. Well, one too many eggs can spoil an omelet kind right. of thing. I mean, what's, who, who's your who's your girlfriend? Her name is Madonna. I said, Madonna. What kind of a name is Madonna? <laughs> <laughs> and she came out and she was just starting to I think she'd done her first album or something. She was starting to become a star. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah. And so you met you mentioned Leo Castelli and, and clearly Leo was the giant of, of, of the day. Did you, you know, kind of pursue a relationship with him? Did it just kind of happen? Because ultimately, you were business partners. Even you shared a gallery space together down in Soho. We we ended up actually having a partnership. We had a, we had a building together on Thompson Street. Uh, we called the gallery Seventy Five Thompson. We did a lot of great shows there. Primarily, Leo's artist was great for me. Mm -hmm. We showed Nauman. We showed Kelly. We showed Stella. We showed Lichtenstein. Uh, great shows all through Leo. And uh, I met Leo like a lot of other young dealers who wanted, you know, the Castelli Gallery was the place to go to right. see great shows. And, and one day I kind of met him, maybe Ralph Gibson, and, and, and Leo and I kind of hit it off well. He liked me. Yeah, he thought I was, you know, kind of, you know, I could, I was a bright young guy in his opinion, mm -hmm. and I could help him. And I started selling art for Leo. Mm -hmm. and, and, and were you like learning from him in terms of how you saw him running the business? I, I, don't, I don't know if I can say I was learning from him, but I, I absorbed a lot of his um, uh, clients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so now, you, you, you mentioned coming to New York, and I guess really the first thing you did was you got a loft on West Broadway. It wasn't really a proper gallery. No, it was a raw loft, and I had to you know, make it habitable. And you didn't have money, but you had art? I, I traded a Bryce Martin painting, which I somehow acquired, and uh, the owners of the loft building, the ones who promoted it, developed it, they were also in the art business. So I said, well, I don't have the $40,000, but I have this Bryce Martin painting. And they said, okay, we'll take the Bryce Martin painting. So they really knew life. enough at that time, to, and they were collectors. Well, yeah, they, they knew that you know, Bryce Martin was all I mean, it's kind of amazing. So art. Bryce was really the, the, uh, your first part of your first art world acquisition of this loft yeah. and yeah. now you know back in a part of your 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 roster and putting on beautiful shows so it's kind of an amazing uh, bookend um, and so um, and then 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 something about you also didn't have the money to decorate this loft you really didn't have a lot I of money I didn't have a lot of money <laughs> I mean, what, are you trying to make me feel bad <laughs> <laughs> so so how did you get the place decorated um, well peter marino who who I didn't know, I didn't know. In fact, I don't think I even knew who Peter Marino was, but the, I was on the fifth floor, and on the there was a double loft on the sixth floor, the top floor. Uh, this guy named Ara Arslanian, uh, a diamond dealer. That was, that was his loft, and Peter Marino was doing a really, you know, lavish kind of renovation for him. And I met Peter kind of going to look at the loft with, with Ara, and I said, well, I got this little loft down here. I don't have that kind of money, but if you could maybe help me. And so he, uh, you know, he did the loft for me. For? Nothing. I thought he did it for a Twombly. I traded him a Twombly drawing. Okay. I yeah. traded him a Twombly um, blackboard drawing. So the, the, the barter he network okay. was... He did okay. <laughs> does he still have it? I think he does still have it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, all right, and then just while we're down there, so then ultimately you, you, you're moving to Worcester, um, this incredible space in Worcester, which Rich, Richard Serra takes credit for finding for you or for being the impetus for you to... to uh, he might have. I don't remember. I mean, he, he, was, he, the, he was the uh, opening show. He says that he was walking with you and uh, wanted a space that was big enough to show his works. And yeah. This was yeah. something that was going to yeah. work. I think we had... Uh, 
it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough image, but you can see the work fits in yeah. there nicely. Yeah, it was a beautiful space. It was a beautiful space, very clean. And that was a, a space that you had a lot of great shows at, a lot of seminal shows for me, because that was when I was first really getting into the art world and right. spending a lot of my weekends going down there. And, you know, I remember very well the, uh, the Damien Hirst show there. That was such an incredible that show. Was, that was a great show. How did you first hear and meet Damien? And, and, and that show was a pretty major undertaking because a lot of that work was pretty significant and had to be you know, manufactured. And how was that all? To well, I met, da I met Damien. It was similar to the Basquiat story. As it, you know, I, I, when I'd come to London, I started going to London yep. you know, to, to kind of get around a little more. And one of, my, one of the first stops I'd make was the Saatchi Gallery. I'd always go to Charles Saatchi because he had the best shows and he had, the, you know, he was a genius. He had mm -hmm. amazing shows. And I was there one day and it was a group show, maybe three or four artists. And I walk into this room and then there's this shark, this gigantic shark in a case with, which turned out to be formaldehyde. I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it was like, it just it blew my mind. I, I had no idea who did it. Mm -hmm. I went to the phone in, in, in the office at, at Boundary Road, got Charles on the phone. I said, who did this shark? It's just, oh, that's Damien Hirst. He's going to be the most famous artist in the world. <laughs> and so I met Damien through Charles and uh, started you know, a long relationship. One thing led to another. I mean, I still remember, this, this is an ashtray. I still remember this thing stunk to high heaven. It's filled with cigarettes. I still have that. And it's still <laughs> Still stinks. <laughs> and I remember this is like a ball up in the air. There's like yeah, an air shooting out of this. This thing knives, turns. And, and of course, this is another split animal yeah, that here. A, that was a fantastic show. And, and one of these sp spun around, literally. This one, I think, was spinning. Well, this, this, this big, long, this series of, of, of vertical uh, vitrines here had a cow that was severed like... like and you could walk in between, exactly. Yeah, I remember that. But it was right. But the, 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 the funny part of the story is that's exactly when mad cow disease was at its peak. <laughs> and we couldn't get the, the, that work of art into the United States because even though it was in pickled in formaldehyde, <laughs> nobody's going to eat it. Customs would like it. There was such a blanket quarantine. Frank Lautenberg, who's a great guy, a uh, senator from New Jersey, I knew Frank a little bit. I called Frank up. I said, "You got to help me out, man. I got this. Our show is our show is over if we can't have this is the centerpiece." And so he called whoever he had to call, and we, we got the got the piece in. Yeah, yeah I mean it was an incredible. Yeah. It was an incredible thing. Um, all right. So and and so then in 2000 you open a London gallery. Right. Uh, first in Hedden Street, and obviously now there's a whole bunch of different galleries. You know, it may not seem as big a deal today, but that was a very big deal at the time. It was kind of like unwritten rules in the art world where you kind of had New York and somebody else had London and right. somebody else had Germany. W was Did you view that as like an aggressive business move? I mean, obviously Anthony Dauphé was the big player in London and, and did you did you see it as a very competitive, threatening move to I about, him? I don't know about threatening. I think, I think, you know, businessmen always want to be competitive mm -hmm. and I don't know about threatening. Um, it just seemed like a, a, a good evolution of, what, of my business and my gallery. And, and, and I was excited about opening something in London, having that kind of an adventure, getting a staff together, to working on shows. It, 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 it got my juices going. So I, I kind of went for it right away. As soon as we found a space that was suitable, I said, let's do it. We started having shows. We ended up moving to another space. And then we continued to kind of grow our our business in, in London since since that first gallery on Hedden Street. Yeah, it's funny to hear you talk about it. You can see like some real enthusiasm about just finding a new property and getting yeah. it developed and being in a new country. And you've kind of repeated that model quite a bit. But it, there's, an, there, there's an excitement to do yeah. that. And, 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 and oftentimes, it seems like you went to Cy Twombly to open these new spaces. He was just your go-to for so many years. To it kind of, I'm having a new new gallery. You know, I need a new Cy Twombly show. It was it was it was a great way to pay for the renovation. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and Cy and was always and he was and he was just you know he was he was a great friend of mine. He became one of my closest friends, but he was just one of those artists that would just say, oh, okay, let me see what I can do, and then he would he would make a show for me. And how much time did he need? It wasn't the time he needed to make the paintings because. Cy painted pretty fast, you know, like Picasso or like Basquiat or certain artists. Certain artists, it's not about spending five years on a painting. They can do a painting in a day, and it could even be better than the guy that takes five years. Mm -hmm. But um, he would, he's not, he, on the other hand, he wasn't the kind of artist that every day would go to the studio and work. 
he had to have some idea of what he wanted to paint. He had to literally see the painting. And when he saw it, and when he felt good about it, then he would go execute. And that's the way he worked. So he worked in spurts. He'd work for a month, all day, every day. And then he wouldn't work for six, seven months, eight months. He wouldn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. he, would, I mean, he wouldn't work. So he was an unusual artist in that way. And most artists that I've worked with and know about, they go to work in the morning, they right. make a painting. And but he was somebody that if you gave him a date, you know, May of next year, he would be like, okay, I'll go. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll, 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 I don't want to disappoint you, Larry. One but time we went, I got to tell you, again, it was a great, great uh, I know we don't have limitless time, but um, he, was, he was painting, he'd go back and forth between Italy and Virginia. He'd paint a show in Virginia, and then you get tired of Virginia, you can't stand this crappy food, I gotta get back to Italy. And then he'd, go, and then he'd say, these, 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 these Italians are driving me nuts, I gotta go back to Virginia. So he would go back and forth, and he had studios in both City, and he was gonna make a show for his 75th birthday. I think of it now that he would have been 90. And I, was, I went down to Virginia to see the paintings in Lexington, checked into the little, little be, uh, bread, and, uh, bed and breakfast where I always stayed, and, and, uh, and, and that night, before I went back to my room, he said, Larry, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to do the show. Uh, really? <laughs> I was so <laughs> horrible news. Right. Um, because the show was gonna open in about two months, and he said, I, 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 don't, wanna, I don't wanna disappoint you, but the paintings are just terrible. They're just mud. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything about it. So, I, oh man, what, you know. So go, go to, Go to bed, get up in the seven o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Cy. 7.30 in the morning, I get a call from Cy. Don't leave. He repainted every canvas that day. And and those paintings are in Glenstone and with the bro. Which body of work was this it? This is called uh, 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 what is it called? Passage of time, those those pale blue paintings oh, with yeah. the white. I think it was like the birthday paintings. I think it was, it was yeah, right around the birthday. Yeah, you had a show, it was time, beautiful. Yeah. They're all beautiful paintings. I never saw what the underlying right. you know, mess was, but they came out beautiful. All right, so this is an early one where maybe you guys went to Target together? <laughs> uh, no, he was a Walmart guy. Walmart guy? Yeah, Walmart guy. <laughs> that was part of our routine. When we'd go to Virginia, he liked going to Walmart, and we'd wander up and down the aisles for a couple of hours. I mean, it was like... Seriously? Very relaxing. What was he buying at Walmart? He just liked looking at the stuff and, uh, <laughs> and just kind of... He just, it was like a... Larry, let's go to Walmart. Some kind of a zen thing. I mean, all right, now you know, I you got them at Walmarts in these rural areas are really almost like civic centers. I mean, it's right. where people kind of congregate. And All right, so I got, I got a few in a row here. So, yeah. so this is relatively, this is a while ago. Uh, yeah. So you're looking at the side, you're looking at that painting. I, I kind of think you're looking at that painting like, that looks really good. Yeah, that's a good one. Then you go here, you're looking at it like, <laughs> I, really think, I really think that's good. And this is the one where I think you asked Cy if you could buy it, and he said yes. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> now you're pretty excited. <laughs> Um, that was a good one. And this is a great image I have you and uh, Richard that's when, Sarah. That's when, uh, that's when uh, Richard and Cy won the, uh, the Golden Lion. They gave them each the Golden Lion Award in Venice. That's, you know, they each, uh, I think Cy was showing Lepanto, and Richard had these torqued ellipses. Um, it was, it was so here, here's uh, just, the, the, I think these, these are the paintings, paintings you're these talking are the paintings about. I'm talking about, yeah. They definitely look spectacular. They're beautiful. It's the winter painting. That's the winters. Those are Britannia Street. Those are the roses. London. Yeah. So this is Rome. Rome. Spectacular opening, gallery opening, there. Opening the gallery there. And then in Greece. Athens. One thing that's amazing is I was told that you have more gallery space than the Tate Modern now. Than who? Than the Tate Modern. What more, more square footage. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of scary. You have better sales too, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there is there is there a, a, a geography you you want to conquer next? Is there any place that you can see that you don't? Not have right a now. I think we've got enough galleries for the time. You never know when something comes along that really seems interesting. You, you think about it, but I don't feel like there's. I don't, I don't feel like I need to open another gallery right now. No. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about portraits. You've sat for a number of portraits, and a lot of artists have also chosen to paint you. Uh, this is the one Mark Dennis did of you, which is a, yeah. a, a good painting, and then. Here we have Elizabeth Payton, which you sat for. Um, she's a great painter, but I don't know that painting. You know. <laughs> <laughs> serious. You look I serious. She, I don't know if she, I thought she liked me until I. <laughs> <laughs> and then a great David Hockney painting. Which oh, that was, great. it was so much fun sitting for David. And then the Basquiat 
Yeah, he did that in his studio when I was standing there. So when you're when you're sitting for Bosque, when you're sitting for um, for all three of them, but I guess maybe the Hockney in particular, is it is it a, a kind of a work? Is it fun? Are you chatting? While well, you're Hockney, he wants you to give him three days, and I could only give him two. And I think he was a slightly irritated, but I literally had to get back to New York, and I had no, I couldn't do anything about it. So that was a two day sit. Uh, Elizabeth Payton is really, she's a lovely woman. You go to her apartment in the village and she puts on, you know, Dylan and you just sit there and it was very pleasant. Um, Basquiat painted that thing probably in a couple hours. Right. And, uh, and that was fun because you, you guys were such good yeah, friends at that yeah. time. And so the obvious one that I, I would show if, it, if I had it, but it's not here, is the Warhol portrait. So how, how is there no Warhol portrait? Well, because he died. <laughs> because we, had you know, I, we, he wanted to do my portrait and... Uh, and we never got around to it, and then he died. He was only 58 years old. It was, he, nobody expected him to die. Mm. Incredible. Wish, wish I had done that when he was around. Yeah. All right, so I wanted to just look at, uh, talk about Malaparte for a second. So right. <clears throat> when you look at this, you talk about uh, expanding gallery spaces. This is a, a, a spectacular house on, on a cliff in Capri, uh, built in like 1937. And somehow or other, you looked at this and you're like, I don't know, my, 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 my friends could come up these 200 stairs from the water <laughs> and we could maybe figure out a way to get a big table on the roof and we could fill the house with paintings. Yeah, let's have a gallery show there. Yes. How does that happen? Uh, well, it happened because the owner of the house is the original Malaparte family and, and, and the, the lady of the house is really a wonderful, warm person. And, and I think she liked the fact that we were bringing, you know, this this new life to to the house, it, and so she was very, you know, accommodating and happy happy to let us do this. We get an, we get a local restaurant in in Capri that brings the food in, 60 people, one long table on the roof, and then the the great thing about the show is it's only one night, uh, and if you want to buy a painting. You have to go there and buy the painting. No, no, no photographs are distributed. No, uh, no advance. Slightly exclusive. Well, it's just a, it's a way to well because it's one night. You mm -hmm. can't say well I can't make it. You know I can't make. I'll, I'll be there in a week. Forget it. Right. So you got to show up. I mean, it is a pretty spectacular place, and uh, it's it's usually a full moon. It, these are these are some of Larry's guests on the different boats here. Yeah. This one is definitely one of your guests. Yeah. And then this is the dinner on the roof that they squeeze the table in. There's Bryce and There's Ed, a full moon Ed Ruscha and the full moon. Definitely a, a nice evening. Here's This is a Twombly show that was there in 15. And this is a house that people are still living in, just to yeah. get in mind, oh, right? Yeah. So there was a Grochon show the following year, just in the bedroom. I mean, just uh, absolutely Beautiful. incredible, incredible uh, experience. I'm um, happy to say I was there, which was, and I enjoyed every second of it. Um, when you when you put on some of these incredible shows, you, you you're kind of the inventor of these kind of museum quality shows, whether it's Picasso and whatnot, where nothing is for sale. First of all, ha how's that? Well, that's not really. How's that business model work? Yeah. No, I mean we don't say nothing is for sale, but it's basically very very little is for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're not selling the paintings that are lent by the MoMA, for right. instance. But you know, sometimes. It's, it's, it's a good context to sell a painting or two. Very few of them are for sale in these historical But places. is it like you, you will start with one very valuable painting and then build a show around that one painting? It's, there's all different ways. It, sometimes it comes from a group of paintings that we're able to get or it comes from a foundation or there are different ways to put it together. It depends on the artist and... And are they, they're usually curated internally. Internally. But now you have like world-class curators on the staff. That's, right. that's also part of the business model now. We sometimes use outside curators if it, if, it, if it makes more sense, but usually we do it ourselves. And is there anything in the works that you can kind of talk about that's kind of in that, in that realm? Uh, nothing I can talk about right now, actually. Mm -hmm. But there's always something there's like something that. There's something coming, yeah. Something coming, something exciting. <laughs> um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about some of your business practices. Um, you pay commissions as part of the sales process of your salespeople. Right. It doesn't seem like anybody else does, and if anybody does, it's not really well known. Why is it so successful for you and nobody else has figured that out? I can't speak for other people. I mean, you know, um, I just think if people, if people are, you know, talented and they're able to particularly 
make sales, and which is obviously good for the gallery, good for me, good for the artists we represent. Why not? Why not give them? Why not give them? You know, a commission. Why not? I think it motivates people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it over motivates them, and you have you know two or three people fighting for the. But th those those times are really few and far between. I I, j I just think it's a good way to. You know, to, I can't speak for what other gals. Has there been an evolution? Because it seems that maybe some of that infighting that you that you alluded to, you you, you heard more about that years ago. You don't hear about it as much. Is 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 the is, as the business maybe has matured? Is is that a little bit Who's less business? prevalent? Your business? No, we still do the. We still pay people. With no, but I'm saying there's less infighting. There's less of the competition. Yeah, yeah, because of, you know systems and more of a clear understanding of what the parameters are, and when you when when you have you know when you have something an issue that comes up repeatedly, then you kind of, you have to look at what the structure is that may be leading to that kind of friction. And you're not gonna eliminate 100% of it, but it's a, it's a good observation. And you know, as, 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 as I think of who your clientele is, it's unprecedented the number of incredible business people that you're dealing with, whether it's, uh, you know, Mucha Prada, name a CEO, name a global successful business leader, they're a client of yours. Are, have you, can you think of things that you've gleaned from them that you've applied to your own business? I mean, are you, are you learning kind of from them in some ways as they may be, you know, kind of doing business with you? Well, uh, maybe not directly, but I think the lesson you learn from, you know, successful people is, you know, just the obvious stuff. Work hard, stay focused, and, um, you know, treat your, treat your people correctly. Are you, are you are you more of a carrot or a stick as a CEO? You maybe maybe you'd have to ask them. <laughs> I, I, I'd say carrot. You say the carrot works. And as as the business has grown, Larry, it's it's hundreds of employees, sixteen galleries, supposedly a billion plus of a year in sales. I can't think of any other billion dollar business in the world that theoretically could disappear. It, because it's so reliant on the leader. Is your business something that could survive you? Is there, there well, we're working we're, on that? Is, we're is that working, realistic? We're working on that. We've, I've just started um, you know, really focusing on that and we're doing some things internally and in other ways that I, I don't really want to get into here that uh, will, I think, get us beyond me or my, you know, my ultimate demise or retiring. I don't plan on retiring, but I, you know, it's, it's a great, I think we've built a great gallery a great business and i would like to see that i mean the tra i don't have children mm -hmm. and that's usually how these legacies are established um, you know with generational mm -hmm. fa and i don't i don't have that so it, it's a, it's a little trickier but um th this is something this is something that's really important so it is something you care about i do care about it yeah and then in, in terms of um just last thing on the market the current art market it seems like there's a little bit of a bifurcation between the kind of top tier galleries that seem to be thriving, opening new spaces, oftentimes building giant new buildings around the corner from their existing recently new giant new buildings. Right, right. Um, and yet the middle and, and, and certainly the smaller galleries are really struggling and a lot of them are, are going out of business. Right. Is that something that you think is going to continue or do you, you know, do you think that's just the nature of the beast and the bigger galleries are going to just play it to a broader market? I mean, how is it going to well, I, You know, I, these things, I think these things run in cycles and I think now there's a like a consolidation, I guess you can use that word, uh, where galleries are actually buying other galleries, literally buying other galleries um, to kind of scale their business up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they could overshoot. You know, I mean, there's three new towers, art towers, being built in Chelsea right now. Right. 50, 60, 70,000 square foot art towers for one gallery. So um, you, we'll, see, we'll see how that works. And, you know, maybe maybe goes too far that way, and then all of a sudden a new group of, of dealers comes in at a different level, and it looks like a refreshing alternative. I, I do think that um, that when things are good in the art market, everybody kind of wants to be an art dealer and everybody wants to open a gallery and there's not an infinite supply of talented, interesting artists. So I've seen this cycle before and I think it's sort of a natural thing. It's a, obviously it's painful if, if you're the gallery that's under that pressure or you have to close, but you know, there's no guarantees in business. Right. I mean, even with these giant buildings going up, it seems like such a core part is still art fairs. 
I mean, is, is the art fair at this point just a necessary evil? Do you enjoy the they're art really, fair? They're really, they really become more and more important in, in, you know, in terms of the bottom line of galleries and, 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 and generating revenue and, and exposing your artist to a, to a much broader audience than you could in a, you know, even, even in a major gallery exhibition. And I think that trend's going to continue. Um, do you still have some artists that say, "I just don't want to be in art fairs," or you just can't do that Occasionally, but most of them, most of them do want to be. And you can't put every artist in every fair. I mean, some artists just don't produce enough work to do that. Other artists, if they're more productive, they can they can distribute to fairs. But um, yeah, it's a great it's a great part of the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a lot of fairs now. I mean, right. sometimes we out, geez, there's another fair. Where are we going to get the <laughs> you, have, you have to go out and buy art to put in the next fair, mm -hmm. uh, because you can't always ask the artist just to keep producing work for fairs. I mean, they'll just say, "Hey, listen, you know." I, right. But um, it's it's definitely it's definitely a, a you know a plus for the overall you know art art business. I think it's a bigger piece of the pie than it was 10, 15 years ago. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So in addition to being a great deal, Larry, you also have built one of the great collections in the world. These are all works from your own collection. This great Jeff Koons painting, incredible Lichtenstein. You know, iconic Ed Ruscha. I mean, this is a small snippet. This Warhol, great Cy Twombly, and of course, this amazing Richard Serra at your place out in the Hamptons. But, you know, what what has been your perspective as a collector? Have you have you particularly bought these things just because you loved them and wanted to have them? Were they things that you know you kind of bought thinking that you might sell them down the road? I mean, what was the nature of the collecting from the beginning and to today? If it's evolved a little bit. Um. Well, as you know, as, as my business grew and as I had the means to buy, you know, you know, more major things, and th that obviously had a, had a bearing on my collecting. But I think from from the earliest, you know, time of my gallery when I started buying drawings, and I I just like I I like collecting. I like I like acquiring. I like you know living with art. I like the process. It's almost like another process. I mean, I I can afford to do it because of my business. But it's sort of a separate, it's almost like a separate activity. Um, I found also, just parenthetically, uh, the people who work at the gallery, salespeople particularly I'm talking about, um, I will say that's a little too crude because they do a lot of other things. They work with artists, they work on, but one of their functions is selling. The, the people at the gallery who buy art, collect art for themselves, almost always end up being the most successful. It's not like if you if you just if you're just going to make some money and sell some art and you know then it doesn't it just it hasn't to more it hasn't penetrated yeah. you as a collector. There's an underlying passion that's you know, part of it. And you know what things are worth and you kind of get it, it gives you a, a different sense of um, what you're doing. But for me, it's just I just love you know, I love building a collection. I think it's and is there a bright line or are the things that you you have in your collection also for could be for sale if somebody very a crazy very thing? rarely. I mean I, I mean very very rarely do I sell things that, are, that I really consider my private collection. I mean you know any of the things you've shown here I could I could sell very easily for you know handsome sum. But um, if you if you start doing that then it, then you don't you don't have a collection. Mm -hmm. It's just inventory that you hang in your house, and and I and I do look at it as a different as a whole different. You know, thing. It's not just inventory in my house. It's stuff that's part of my life that I live with that I enjoy. You know, I enjoy getting up in the morning and seeing them on the wall. I and when I go to bed at night, I enjoy seeing them. It's it gives me a lot of pleasure, and I think that's what that's what makes a collector. And what's what's the long term plan for what happens to your collection? Um, I'd like to be able to afford to give it away. Uh, to keep it together to as keep a it, well. I mean, you know, I do have to sell. You know, I can't keep everything together. Uh, but keep the the vast majority of it together, and to somehow make it in, as a gift. To have an identity of a g the goes. Well, I don't fashion. know what form that's going to take. Um, you know, probably some other institution. I'm not going to build. A, I'm not Mitch Rails. I'm not going to build a Glenstone or, or or Eli Broad. I don't have the means to do that, or really the ambition to do that. But I would like it to be. Uh, you know, I would like it to live on as a collection. Well, let's hope it's not for a long time. But I, I, it will be, it will be, it's a beautiful collection. I know it's continuing to grow. So, all right, let's take some questions from the audience here that everybody was nice enough to, to submit. Um, okay, this is, uh, I'm a 22-year-old art history major who wants to open an art gallery. What advice would you give me? Wait a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> um, what single sale are you most proud of? I can't say. I mean, the, 
Luckily, quite a few. It's hard to say. Is there one, one major one that was a seminal sh seminal sale, either earlier in your career or to a collector you had been trying to get into forever? Or? Well, when I sold the uh, Mondrian uh, Victory Boogie Woogie, uh, which is arguably the most important painting Mondrian ever made, one of the great modern masterpieces of the 20th century, Burton and Emily Tremaine owned the painting for many years. They bought it from can't remember the dealer's name right now, but they literally bought it off Mondrian's easel. It, it's an unfinished painting, and it was ha it's hanging in their apartment on Park Avenue, and it was known that they would sell it, and nobody, nobody could find the buyer, nobody came up with the right price, and I was able to sell that painting. It was a breakthrough for me. I never sold anything at that price before, and historically important before, and I, I, was, you know, I was very proud of that sale. Mm -hmm. um, you're known for having artists come to you from other galleries. Sometimes it does happen the other way around. What could make an artist depart Gagosian? They, they think they can do better elsewhere. They think that another gallery, or maybe they're tired of the relationship, or maybe they think they need a, a reboot with a new dealer. Um, does it ever, like, do you take it personally? Is it, does it, is, I mean, you can't I, be I happy about no, it. No, it's business, you know, I don't really tell, you know, I mean, it can be, it can annoy me for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you get used to it after a while. I mean, there, there haven't been a whole lot of- There's departments. been several and that have all, left and, and then come back. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, they come back. That happens also. And um, sometimes they, they leave and everybody say, oh, you lost that artist. Well, the truth is you didn't really want to keep them. I mean, I, this is not sour grapes. I'm just saying that that also happens mm -hmm. where you kind of lost your enthusiasm for the work or maybe it just doesn't interest you anymore. I mean, you got, there's, there's a balance between being loyal as a dealer, which is what everybody you know, wants to be, loyal. And if, it, if, if, if the work just doesn't, you know, if the, if the artist is really not making good work and it's going on for quite a while, it, it's hard for a dealer to be loyal under those circumstances, particularly if the work's, work's not selling. And an artist may feel that maybe in another, with, a fresh, with fresh blood, a new dealer, they can they can you know get get activity going. I understand that. Right. And and does does scalability ever become an issue? I mean, are you just not able to be there for as many artists as may want you to be there? I mean, you have 120 artists listed. I mean, however many artists that are really putting on shows for you, it's a large number. I, I spend a lot of time going to artist studios. Anybody who works in the gallery uh, who knows me, I'm I'm very hands on. I, one of the things I enjoy is leaving the gallery in the morning or leaving home in the morning, going to maybe two or three studios, and that's my whole day. I love that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's certain artists w that need more attention there's, because of the logistics of how the work is made, or maybe they just need more face, to whatever the reasons are. Some artists, you, you, they, don't, they don't necessarily even want you to come to the studio. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of, you know, but I, I like going to artist studios. I never feel like I don't have enough time. Sometimes when a new artist will come to the gallery, they'll say, geez, Larry, you have all these galleries. You've got all these artists. I, am I, gonna ever, am I gonna ever see you again? And they're usually pleasantly surprised that I, you know, I, I do You're like there. to go. Yeah, I'm there. I wanna see what's going on. I wanna see what they're making. I wanna talk to them. And every one of the artists that you do a show of you representing, you like the work. Yeah, absolutely. So you're I mean, the tastemaker ultimately making the decisions as who comes into the gallery. Well, we have we have a you know committee. I guess you can call it that. Right, but clearly, if and you don't like the work, it's not coming. And if I don't like the work, it's going to be tough to get me to change my <laughs> change my. <laughs> okay, so this is a question. What one artist did you pass on that you wish you did not? Oh, I can't think of one. I can think of artists I wish I represented that I don't represent. All right, that's we'll, we'll take that. But that's, uh, we'll that's, let you have a replacement question. Okay. What artist don't you represent that you wish you represented? Uh, Charlie Ray probably would be the one that I wish I would, because I just think he's a great artist. And I happen to put a collection of his work together. Uh, he, uh, I must have six or seven major pieces by Charlie. I think he's a great artist. I don't represent him. I think he has a great dealer. Matthew Marks is a genius art dealer. He's doing great for Charlie. But do I wish I represented Charlie? Absolutely. And of course, there's others, but like Gerhard Richter, I'm sure you would. Gerhard yeah. Richter, yeah, but yeah, Gerhard Richter is an old, you know, Charlie kind of, I know him generationally, is a little closer to me in that way. Mm -hmm. Gerhard Richter, who wouldn't want to represent Gerhard Richter? Right. Um, okay, you're known for your business sense. What happens if you like an artist, but their work does not sell? How long, how patient can you be with them? Well, it depends on why it doesn't sell. I mean, some artists, their, their markets are very slow. The work is very challenging. I can be, 
infinitely patient with an artist like that. I really don't base representing an artist on what I, I mean, sometimes people come to me, you know, you could represent this artist. I'm not gonna name an artist because it's a bit of a pejorative. Right. And, and they, they sell like crazy. You know, you'll, you'll just coin it, Larry. I, I'm not interested in that story. Right. Maybe that might surprise people because I'm sort of thought of as a guy who's like, wants to make money, wants to sell. But I, if, I don't, if I don't respect the artist, there are artists that we represent that just now after they, uh, Walter De Maria. I mean, I've worked with Walter De Maria 20, 25 years. Very difficult, very slow sales, but such an important artist, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that I, I never ran out of patience. Um, okay, do you see a common, I uh, can't read that one, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, you are well known for throwing incredibly fun parties or having small dinners with fascinating groups of people. Is this just your own enjoyment, or is it part of a business model that you think your clients would want to be? A part I think of? it's both, but it's not a calculating thing like having. You know, I love having dinner. I love entertaining. I've always have since I was a kid. Uh, when I was in grammar school, for some reason, in a little crummy little house we lived in, my friends would all come over to my house. I don't know why. So it's always <laughs> been. That's just the way I'm wired. I like entertaining. I like having people over. Is it good for business? Yeah, sometimes, not always, but, um, but I enjoy it. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy being around people. Larry, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Great talk. All right.